Hello and welcome to today's session on what lies ahead for the Sahel, a panel discussion. We'll be joined today with speakers Michelle Gavin and Jendaya Frazier and our moderator is Oge Onabagu. How to ask a question. Questions are welcome at any time. If you prefer to write your question, you can type it in the Q&A box located at the bottom center of your Zoom screen. Be sure to use the Q&A box and not the chat box. Please note that you must have your name displaying to ask a question. If you would like to ask your question aloud directly to the speaker, please follow these instructions. One, use the raise hand button to let us know that you would like to ask a question. The raise hand button is located at the center of your screen. Two, when your name is called by the moderator, the World Affairs Council staff will unmute you. A pop-up will appear on your screen, giving you the option to remain muted or to unmute yourself. Select the option to unmute yourself. Three, once you are unmuted, please introduce yourself and ask your question. The attendees will not be able to see you. They will only be able to hear your voice. Four, when you are done asking your question, mute yourself again by clicking the microphone icon at the bottom left corner of the screen. We will reset you as a regular attendee. How to turn on, off, closed captions. Automatic closed captions for this program have been enabled. If you would like to turn on closed captions, click the live transcript button on the bottom right of your screen and then click show transcript. If you would like to change the size of the captions, you can do so by clicking the same live transcript button and then subtitle settings. Thank you. Great, well, thanks so much, Cheryl. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's discussion on the Sahel. I'm Jackie Miller, President and CEO of the World Affairs Council here in Seattle. You know, we don't hear enough about this region uh, in the news or enough about most parts of Africa for that matter, um, but it's an important area with significant potential uh, and significant challenges as our uh, excellent speakers and moderator will talk through. Uh, just this morning, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee held a hearing on instability in the Sahel and what U.S. Uh, options and interests are in the region and whether U.S. Uh, policy and security assistance there, there has failed, which is something that we might get to as well. Um, but first, a couple of quick notes um, on some upcoming programs. This Friday, we're going to have a lunch program on Seattle-driven innovations in climate sustainability. We'll be joined by Boeing, Warehouser, Microsoft, and Amazon, all of whom are deeply uh, enmeshed in this work in Seattle and beyond, being all global companies. On November 15th, we're going to have a virtual program looking at hostage diplomacy or how state actors are detaining foreign citizens to try and gain diplomatic leverage. There are dozens of Americans currently being detained abroad, including Austin Tice, who is believed to have been held by Syria or is believed being held by Syria, and he's uh, spent over 4,000 days in detention. Uh, recently, Wall Street Journal reporter Evelyn Gershkovich was arrested in Russia for espionage, and I can't even say he's the most recent journalist detained by Russia. Just last week, another American journalist was arrested there on espionage, espionage charges. So you can register for those programs of any of our upcoming programs um, on our website, and we hope to see you at some of our upcoming discussions. But let's turn to today's discussion. We are so lucky to be joined by these experts and practitioners who are going to help us get a better understanding of the dynamics of the region. Uh, we have with us uh, Ambassador Michelle Gavin. She's a former U.S. ambassador to Botswana, and she is currently the Ralph Bunch Senior Fellow for Africa Policy Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. We're also joined by Ambassador Jedi Fraser, former U.S. ambassador to South Africa, and she is currently the, the Dreamland Distinguished visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, and also an adjunct senior fellow for Africa studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. And our moderator, did it, moderator today is Oge Anabagu. She's the director of the Africa program at the Wilson Center, and she has decades of experience in governance and democracy, Africa and US Africa relations. Their full bios are in the chat. I only gave you the very top headlines, um, but there's a lot more in there. So please take a look at their full bios if you didn't see them when you registered for our event. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, Oge, over to you. Thank you very much, Jackie. And it is a pleasure to be here and to be joined by both Michelle and Jendai for this important conversation. Um, 
I know that everyone who has clicked in to join this discussion, obviously you, you came in because there is an interest in trying to understand and learn more about what is happening in the region. So I will not go into too much background, but we'll go ahead and jump right into the conversation because um, there is a lot to cover in just one hour. So I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, Michelle. And if you could please give us an overview of what you see as the root causes of the political instability and some of the challenges that we see in the Sahel today. Sure, well, thank you so much. And thank you for the invitation uh, to be here today. <laughs> you know, I think what we see in the Sahel, uh, it, obviously it's a multi-dimensional crisis, right? We have humanitarian crisis, we have political crisis, security crisis, climate crisis. Um, and what, you know, this question of root cause and what's underlying all of it, I, I think, you know, clearly uh, weak governance is a, a huge piece of the answer, right? The inability of the state to provide security, to provide economic opportunity for populations that are exponentially growing. So these are uh, very young populations. Um, they're getting larger all the time, meaning the job creation imperative, the public services imperative around education and healthcare um, just keeps growing, right? So the job of government gets bigger and bigger, um, but their capacity uh, is not keeping pace. Um, you know, I do think it's important to note there are sort of other kind of exogenous factors, the uh, the climate crisis, which is affecting migratory patterns, bringing communities into conflict with one another over scarce resources, um, that can create a grievance space that can be um, exploited. Uh, there is no question that the uh, instability in Libya, in particular, had real ramifications for the Sahel. Um, and we can have a discussion about you know, how much or how little and who bears responsibility, but I think it's pretty undeniably a piece of what is going on. And then you have um, you know, the, the other two things I'd throw into this pretty toxic mix would be uh, the exacerbation of the security crisis by a militarized response that has not um, prioritized human rights and community protection. So you've got populations uh, at risk because of violent extremists, but also in fear of the security forces who are supposed to be keeping them safe because uh, there, there hasn't been uh, adequate attention to uh, community protection. And then finally, you have opportunistic outside actors who, uh, for their own geopolitical reasons, uh, see a benefit to instability in the Sahel, uh, who help to kind of exacerbate narratives that provide clear villains um, and, and shape an information environment that can create pockets of support for authoritarianism, even though it's not, you know, the military regimes that, that have, have taken root to date have not been able to make progress on the security situation. In fact, it's getting worse in those places. Mm -hmm. So I just finished with a, a point that uh, Senator Coons made uh, in the hearing earlier today, just to give people a, a sense of the scope and scale of suffering in a place that we we don't talk about uh, nearly often enough. There were more people killed in terrorist attacks in the Sahel in the last five years than were killed in terrorist attacks in the rest of the world combined. So it's a it's a um, it's a very difficult problem set, multifaceted, uh, and uh, you know one that demands attention. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Michelle, for laying all of that out as we look at what you've laid out when you talk about the, the root causes, so weak governance, climate security issues, opportunistic um, actors taking advantage of some of the gaps that we see in the region, populations at risk. So as you said, you, you've outlined a, a toxic cocktail <laughs> as you described it right here. So turning to you, Jindai, do you, um, looking at these root causes that have been outlined, 
do these align with your thinking? And do you think that the US in particular, we've been effectively addressing some of these uh, root causes? You're on mute. Thank you. I, I agree 100% with everything Michelle has said, um, but I also think root causes have to go to the root. And the root is the nature of state formation. Um, in many of these countries. I think that we can't ignore that colonial history, um, which has led to very, very weak states. Um, if, you, if you think about even how coups happen, there are sort of deep structural attributes that have to do with governance, political culture, how state society relations um, are organized and have traditionally uh, been carried out. And then there's sort of the triggers of coups, which include you know, things like I'm getting ready to fire the general and so he takes over the country, you know, there, or even, you know, insurgencies, like all of these fighters and weapons coming out of Libya, you know, um, going into the dissatisfaction coming from climate change and lack of development in Northern Mali, right? And connecting with Tareg insurgents that have been having these episodic um, rebellions since the 14th century. And so my point is that it's nothing, it's not new. Um, and I think that fundamentally the structure of the state and its relationship to society is the problem here. Um, and that relationship has been one, if we just take Niger, for example, um, right on the eve of its independence, first of all, they had general um, um, governors who were ruling by edict uh, and you know, society was repressed. Uh, and then they installed chiefs who had no legitimacy with society. Their criteria for being selected was based on their loyalty to the French, mm -hmm. right? And so any time that there was now at independence, the French actually banned political parties except for the one that supported staying within the French community. Uh, and for 14 years after independence, there was a one party state Right, and so that whole tradition of authoritarianism and poor governance doesn't start with African leaders or at independence. It's deeply rooted in the nature of the political culture of these countries. Um, uh, Niger didn't have a multi-party election until 33 years after its independence. <laughs> you know? uh, so that's that just goes to speak to that lack of governance. When we talk about poor governance, it's not something that is about individual personalities. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's rooted in the repressive um, state and weak state structures. And then, and then I would also say that I think that climate really, we really have to look at climate because climate change has led to economic deprivation. It's led to drought. It led to mass migration. Um, those mass nomadic populations hitting against settler populations would create conflict. Um, many of the Tuareg in northern Niger and Mali went to Algeria um, during like the drought in the 90s. They went to Algeria. They went to Libya. They formed insurgency groups. They got armed and they came back into their society. And so where you have insurgency um, and you have economic deprivation and you have weak states with limited legitimacy, um, then they're very, very coup prone um, and the countries are very unstable. Uh, and so I think that really, if we go, so, so going to the second part of your question about has America been effective in its response? Uh, no, because we don't actually deal with the deep rooted nature of these problems. We tend to want to say to them, oh, be good democracies like us. <laughs> you know, you need to do better, just be good democracies. And the problem is in this particular individual leader. Um, and, and then when we get a new leader like Bazoum in Niger, we hug them tight and we say, oh, look, this is the new democratic leader, but nothing fundamentally has changed in the nature of the state and society relationships because a new leader has come into place. Those same institutions are still there. Uh, and the counterbalance to the military during the colonial period was actually the Metropole's army normally. 
right? It was in, with, for instance, in Niger, the first president, there were two attempted coups against him and the French came in and protected him. On the third, when he got overthrown, it was after he complained about lack of investment of French in their, um, in the in the mines in in the uranium mines, <laughs> they were no longer satisfied with him, so they didn't actually support and prop him up. And so, if you if you actually look at across Africa, and I did my dissertation research on it, so that's why I'm going into it a little bit because we're really dealing with this coup phenomena right now. Um, basically, the countries that have had coups, and it's almost all of them, but not all are countries that came to power through constitutional order, right? They, they, they were given their independence or they agitated through national parties, but they didn't have armed struggles. They didn't have military wings to their party and they didn't have really the experience of how to manage the military. Whereas armed struggle countries actually had armed wings to their political parties and they learned how to deal with counterbalancing their military and making sure that they're cognizant of what's happening there. And so you'll see that most of the Southern African countries that had armed struggle have never had coups. Now they say that Zimbabwe had a coup. I don't consider that a coup. <laughs> that wasn't really a coup. The military just changed one political leader for another political leader within ZANU-PF. Um, but anyway, that point aside, it means that these countries also haven't organized their military so that they can actually prevent them from overthrowing them because they haven't put enough attention into them because normally an outside force um, has been the one that has counterbalanced against those coups. And if the outside force decides not to come in, they're gone. Uh, so no, the United States has not done, I think enough. Um, the, the, the challenge for the United States is obviously we have elections every four years. <laughs> so we're a great democracy. Mm -hmm. um, and at best we have a president for eight years and the problems in the Sahel are gonna take a strategy and a, ten, a focus that goes well beyond eight years. Mm -hmm. And so every time you have a new electoral cycle in the United States and if a new person comes in, the policy can change, the strategy can change, the priority can change. Um, there has been great continuity up until I think the Trump administration. <laughs> you know? um, but let's be clear, each one of the administrations, Bush, Obama, Trump, all utilize both all arms of um, American power. And that means AFRICOM with the Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Initiative, going in and trying to support and help these countries fight against the terrorists or insurgencies. We've used humanitarian assistance, significant humanitarian assistance for health, education, um, you know, and, um, and then also assistance towards democracy promotion. So I think it's true to say that, and I know that this is, you know, debatable and a lot of people in Washington, DC will debate it. I will debate it. I personally don't think that our policy has been over militarized. I think our, pro our policy has been under prioritized and that's really been the fundamental problem. Not that there's an imbalance in the various instruments that we use to try to address uh, the challenges of the Sahel. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Those are wonderful points that you've laid out there. And I want to pick up on a few things that you've said, and I'll turn back to you, Michelle. When you speak about the nature of state formation and um, the under-prioritization of our strategy um, to try to address your strategy in trying to address some of the um, the political instability that we see in the Sahel. Michelle, I'm wondering if you could pick up from here and talk a little bit more about some of the existing tools that we have, some of the policies, some of the strategies that we currently have in place uh, that we are using or implementing in the Sahel. Sure, and I agree. I think um, Jendai made incredibly powerful points about sort of the origins of the states themselves uh, and the uh, model uh, designed to protect a small elite political class um, that was kind of inherited uh, at the creation. Um, you know, the, the U.S. has uh, for many years um, been concerned about violent extremism throughout the region and in 
different iterations um, has pretty consistently been engaged in um, support to security services uh, to try and strengthen their capacity uh, to protect civilians and um, neutralize a terrorist threat. So there's this piece. There's, you know, foreign assistance. Um, there's humanitarian assistance, as Jendai described. I, I think, though, important to acknowledge, and this this is also a debatable point. I'm sure uh, people there are people who will disagree with me, is that as the U.S. I think across multiple administrations has looked at um, the nature of the challenges in the Sahel in the context of all the other foreign policy priorities or even priorities on the African continent, there has been a tendency to perhaps defer um, to Paris. Uh, a, you know, the French are, are a close partner uh, to the US in many ways and uh, have uh, long um, tortured in many ways historic links uh, to these countries and uh, for a long time, it had more skin in the game in terms of French presence on the ground, not just military presence, but French citizens, French businesses. Um, I don't think that this has served uh, the U.S. well. Uh, the, <laughs> the nature of French engagement um, is, you know, that shadow of history, the history that Jendai talked about is uh, kind of creates the shape, is the, the scaffolding, right, uh, under which uh, that relationship uh, has developed. And while I agree that it is really difficult to address big structural problems like we see in the Sahel without some burden sharing, some close coordination uh, among states that have concerns. Uh, I also think that uh, that has maybe blinded US policymakers sometimes um, to a situation that was getting worse and not better. Mm -hmm. No, thank you so much um, for that. And before I turn to you, Jendai, I just wanna uh, remind members of the audience that you can feel free to drop your questions um, in the chat and I will be happy to ask them as we continue with the discussion. So Michelle, you've laid out some of the tools, some of the gaps that we have in our existing strategy as we work in, in the Sahel. And Jendai, to pick up on the points that you made about the US strategy in the region being under-prioritized, um, clearly from what, you, what you're what you hearing you speak, um, I, I believe that you think we should be doing more or changing our approach or adjusting our approach. What could an adjusted approach in the Sahel look like, in your opinion? Well, I, I to be honest with you, I think this particular administration doesn't really have a strategy. Um, they did they did a big process of putting out a strategy paper, um, but it's the strategy paper that they put out is more about the tone of America's engagement with Africa versus which countries can can we have leverage with, which countries are more are extremely important for us to try to have influence on the continent. Uh, and instead, I think that they have, I would call it outsource, um, in which Michelle is talking about historically, and this actually goes way back, right? Even the 1945 after World War II, when they were we, were, we were pushing for decolonization, but we deferred to you know the colonial powers. So that this 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 tendency of America to try to um, I wouldn't say run its policy through Europe, but definitely over conscious of what Europe wants to do, and sometimes and often takes a back seat to it. Mm -hmm. um, that tendency has always been there, but I think this administration has particularly been saddled with it, and uh, and and not just to Europe, but also to the Middle East, right? I mean, we're doing Sudan through Saudi Arabia, uh, and so uh, you know, I think that this particular administration needs a real strategy about. For for me, if I were going to do a strategy in Africa, the first thing I would do is look sub regionally. 
because those subregions have their own dynamics, right? Mm -hmm. And within each subregion, I would look at which countries could we really engage that would have leverage on the challenges that we're facing because the neighbors are the most important actors mm -hmm. in trying to address insurgencies and conflicts. The neighbors are the critical because all insurgencies are typically getting their fighters or their material from some cross border point, right? <laughs> you know, or when they, they're pressed by the national uh, security forces, they run a cross border. And so that cross border engagement is absolutely critical. Um, and, and, and working with African countries and African subregions is absolutely critical. And to do that, you have to get on the plane. You know, you have to get out there, you have to engage. Um, the president has to pick up the phone, right? President Biden has not been making enough phone calls to African leaders. He has to get engaged. It doesn't take much time. The national security advisor can't be saying that our focus is on Indo-Pacific and everything else is just fine and then have something blow up in the Middle East in his face because of that, right? And then, you know, God help us, let's hope that nothing happens in Africa that, you know, that impacts our embassies or, you know, American people who we're supposed to protect because of a lack of focus of the administration. And so the person who's been doing a lot of good work, I think, in this administration that can be, you know, that has been mobilized and is, is, is Secretary Blinken. Um, he really, really has been out there. And Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, right? Those two have been probably the most engaged on this and, are, you know, it's necessary, but the President Biden had no meetings at the UN General Assembly on Africa or with, I mean, with any African leader within any African country. So my point is that the very first thing we need to do is get strategic and secondly is get engaged, right? Um, literally get seriously engaged. You know, the assistant secretary needs to not be in Washington, but be on the continent um, traveling and meeting. And, it, you know, she shouldn't let Blinken outdo her. You know, your secretary of state shouldn't travel more than you do, <laughs> you know? So, um, I mean, honestly, I think that uh, they've got the right rhetoric. They've got the right um, people even, uh, but they, they just don't really have an active strategy um, nor uh, sufficient engagement. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your frank and honest um, comments on that. And Michelle, I will turn it back to you still on that same point. The current strategy of, uh, that we have focused on on Africa talks about whole of government approach, interagency approach. What does that really look like? And is that is that happening? Hmm. Um. Sometimes it works and, and sometimes it doesn't. It can be very hard to get the U.S. government all rowing in one direction. Um, but it's particularly hard, frankly, when, you know, parts of our government are better resourced than others. Uh, we've had trouble getting uh, ambassadorial nominees confirmed uh, for the region. So we're, we handicap ourselves um, pretty regularly. Uh, in terms of our ability to be influential, have a permanent presence on the ground, have someone knowledgeable and connected uh, who can, you know, provide uh, uh, help when those principles do uh, come uh, for a visit so that the key messages are, are enforced and the sensitivities are understood. So, yeah, we talk a lot about whole government approach. We don't uh, finance our government that way. And that's part of the problem. But I, I will say I agree with Jendai. I do think there's a lack of strategic clarity here. I can't tell. Are we trying to contain the problem by bolstering the, the coastal West African states, right, where where um, governance is, is by and large working better and, uh, you know, try and keep this uh, this violent extremism from metastasizing further? Is, is that the strategy? Um, how, what is the end game, right, for for even the uh, the work that we had been doing um, before the coup in Niger, uh, or even the coups in Burkina, 
to try and you know work with partners to push back what what are we uh getting at and I think there's been, you know, kind of analysis after analysis, lots of assessments that what's needed is not just, although certainly capable security forces, particularly ones that don't commit human rights abuses willy-nilly, are very important, um, but so too is community peace building, right? Trying to extract the elements of local grievance, resource competition, you know, separate out these threads and address enough of them that there isn't such a grievance space that can be tapped in a lot of these societies. Now that work, that kind of peace building work, that is labor intensive. It requires presence on the ground, knowledgeable presence and time. And, you know, we, we can't even staff our embassy, much less have, you know, that kind of, um, nuanced and sustained footprint. And so, so I asked myself, well, then what are we trying to achieve? And I think that kind of clarity would be helpful. Well, thank you so much. And I, I also want to remind the audience again that, you know, you can send in your questions as we continue the conversation. I see a couple of questions coming in, but before I, I go to some of the questions that I have here, um, I know some of you have touched on, both of you, but Michelle and Dendai, you both touched on recommendations, some recommendations in some of the responses that you've given. Uh, but I want to ask you more broadly, you know, why should America care about the Sahel? Why, sh why should Americans care here? Let me start with you, Jindai. Sometimes I'm cynical. <laughs> <laughs> I say, well, there's no reason. <laughs> you know, if your government doesn't, then, I mean, the, the broad American public pays attention to where the media takes them and the media takes them to where the White House is focused mostly, right? Because um, those visits come in, heads of state come in, and then the media focuses on who the president's meeting with, et cetera. But, you know, I mean, obviously, um, when we got hit in 1998 at our embassies in um in Kenya and Tanzania, when we had the embassy, the East Africa embassy bombings, um, where Al Qaeda hit us. At that time in 1998, people felt like there was no threat to American lives and facilities um, in Africa. There was no, there was no terror threat even um, in 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 Africa, right? And uh, we found out differently. Al Qaeda was sitting right there, and they bombed us in what they called a soft target. Uh, and so when you have a vast area, the, the Sahel, if you think about it, it's like 6,000 kilometers. That would be two times going between New York and California. Twice. That's twice that distance. It's a vast, vast area. And if you have a vast space like that, that's ungoverned, um, and you knock out ISIS in Syria, where do you think they're going to go? Where do they where do they go to reconstitute themselves and continue to be a threat to all of us? And so I think that there's a security and environmental threat there. Um, secondly, we have learned um, in 2020 that disease vectors don't stay in local areas. Um, uh, Dr. Kangasong, our our head of our Office of Global AIDS Coordinator, Pepfar, he said that the traditional, he's a virologist, and he said, traditionally, they think of diseases as starting in, in um, sort of local communities and then spreading out. And he says, but Ebola, not Ebola, but um, COVID-19 started in big cities and then spread inward. Uh, and so what I'm trying to say is we're, it's an interconnected world. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the misery and suffering and economic deprivation um, that takes place in one part of the globe can't be disconnected from us. Um, I would also say if you you go all the way back to World War II and beyond, the United States has always looked for strategic basing, strategic overflight, strategic communications that passes the African continent. It's absolutely too big. So if you're going to have operations in the Middle East or in 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 um, in Europe, at some point you're going to be looking at how to you how do you navigate the continent and where do you base your communications or how do you uh, base your forces. So what we call that strategic lines of communication have always been 
a component of U.S. strategic interests in Africa. And finally, there is um, all of that wonderful sun up there. <laughs> there's, there's all, I mean, when we're talking about having a green economy uh, and that sort of the Africa's natural resources, um, water and sun and in abundance um, can be put to humanity's uh, benefit and the local population's benefit in terms of job creation and economic investment, but also all of us um, getting off of fossil fuels. And so I think those are just some of the reasons. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, um, I think that if the United States is going to call itself a, a great power in the country, in the world, it can't be a great power in a few little areas. Um, it actually has to be able to have its influence be global, recognizing that this world is inter so interconnected. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Michelle, I'm going to turn to you with the same question, why should Americans care about the Sahel? But I want to add on a question here that came in um, uh, in the uh, Q&A. It's from someone who has been living in Niger since 2017. And in the question, they say they've learned a lot that local populations often feel like tools in the hands of great powers. And they're asking a question here as in, who are the major powers? that are using countries, using these countries or exploiting the local populations and what is their bigger global picture? So as you talk about why Americans should care about the Sahel, also touch on some of the, the other countries that might be using or exploiting the situation in the region. Sure. Um, so I agree, I, th I think, and you know, my experience has been that Americans do care about human suffering in general, right? When their attention is called to it. Um, so I also think that the US can't address a number of the most important uh, potential threats of the future, some that Jendai laid out, pandemic disease, climate crisis, et cetera, without a multilateral approach. And it's not just about, well, needing the Sahelian countries, you can get things done without them. But the way Africa perceives the US is informed by the dramatic difference in our apparent concern for some sec security crises versus others. So I would, I would just note that it's not just the Sahel, right? It's the relationships we want to have with African states are are in, informed by our policy in the Sahel and elsewhere, and it's something to think about. I agree with Jendai around you know ungoverned. It's it's not in vogue anymore to talk about ungoverned spaces, but uh, it's incredibly dangerous to have violent extremists who who wish to do harm to America and Americans. You know, kind of. Uh, having safe haven, uh, able to conduct their operations, uh, engage in economic activities to fund their operations, this is a, this is a danger. Then I would note there's a very clear strategy on the part of Moscow to exploit uh, the tensions, the grievances, the dissatisfaction uh, in the Sahel to promote anti-Western sentiment. Um, and a broader kind of ideological alliance between um, Moscow and, and other authoritarians, you know, to suggest that the fundamental problem maybe is democracy itself, right? So you had um, the junta leader from Guinea at the most recent UN General Assembly, right, suggesting that the, the real problem wasn't just... A, a legitimate point he made, right, around uh, so-called democratic leaders that stay too long, that manipulate their constitution. That's a problem. But the real problem, he informed us, is that the West imposed democracy on us, and it's un-African. Having, you know, made himself leader of Guinea, apparently now he speaks for all of Africa. And, but, but polls show consistently, consistently, that African publics absolutely want democratic, accountable governance that works. That's what they want. Now, it's not that surprising. Um, so I, I think, you know, there's a broader uh, struggle going on around uh, 
ideas, the value of accountable governance, the value of laws that apply to everyone, uh, and ignoring whole regions of the world uh, is incredibly perilous. Two more reasons to care. You now have a strip of military controlled governments running across the length of Africa from the Red Sea to the Atlantic Ocean, um, many of which are increasingly aligned with Russia. So this, you know, these, there are, I think, questions about what that will mean for if this persists for the capacity of other powers to uh, project force, to um, threaten sea lanes, these, you know, just have to look at a map and start to get a little bit concerned. And then finally, and I put this at the end because it really troubles me when the Sahel's crisis is always seen through this lens, but there, there are issues of migration, right? If people simply cannot survive in their societies, then it, as anyone would, they will move. And while most migration on the continent is stays within the continent, there there is a large amount of migration going to Europe. And, you know, as we saw during the worst of the Syrian crisis, this can be incredibly destabilizing for some of our closest partners, both politically and economically. Uh, it's not a good thing for democracy. Um, it's not a good thing for a global commitment to human rights when it, it creates opportunity for a particularly virulent kind of populism mm -hmm. um, that leaves us all worse off. Uh, so I think, you know, our European partners are very concerned about this. And I, while I, I, really dislike the framing of uh, this crisis as one entirely about keeping it out of Europe, I do think it's important to think about uh, how dislocating uh, mass migration can be. So there's all of that. So so who's who's involved? Obviously, the French in the, the Francophone countries um, have a very long history, a uh, their presence uh, is felt uh, keenly in the economy. Their military presence has in the past propped up uh, undemocratic uh, leaders sometimes. And there is a, I think a widespread popular sense that they, um, that the status quo was one that they benefited from. Uh, and you do, uh, you have other external parties, of course, interested in some of the resources of the region. You've got uh, Russia, as I said, using uh, this uh, this uh, aggrieved region as a, a zone of opportunity, and, and Wagner is active in in Mali and, and possibly elsewhere. So there's a, a range of of actors who believe that it matters, mm -hmm. um, which is you know another. Uh, I don't want the U.S. after the U.S. policy in the region to be seen entirely through the lens of great power competition, but it's another reason to pay attention. Mm -hmm. no, thank you so much for that. And I want to pick up on another question that has come in, in the box here from Manuela. And the question is, uh, talking about Russia, is there any reason to believe that Russia's goals in the Sahel have changed now that Russia is so deeply engaged in the Ukraine? I'll pass this to you, Jendai. No. Um, in, in fact, if anything, Russia is um, previously to Wagner Group and even directly is exploiting the, the resources of Africa, the gold um, and other resources to help fund their um, war in Ukraine. Uh, and so, no, they, they, you know, basically Russia had very little um, influence in Africa except selling arms. That was that was their major way to get involved in the continent. And now basically they're disruptors. They are um, doing significant disinformation campaigns. At least 17 or so countries have been targeted. They're engaged in at least electoral interference in 15 countries. They've been supporting extra constitutional claims, you know, immediately uh, standing up for these coup leaders. And again, there's the illicit arms and basically the stealing of Africa's resources. Um, so it's Russia's not dis 
um, and in fact, now diplomatically, because of the Ukraine war, they very much want African countries to side with them in international bodies like the UN General Assembly. So they become more diplomatically engaged to try to get those votes on their side um, when the United States or the West and the others who support the Ukrainians are trying to, you know, sanction them and you know, um, kick them out of international bodies, et cetera. They are, they're looking for votes from Africa as well. And so I think that the, and, and, and those votes and, and Africa's engagement is a source of legitimacy for Russia when it's been so delegitimized because of its Ukraine action. So I think in fact, it's just the counter. Um, Russia needs and is more interested in Africa after Ukraine than it was even before, even though it was still before. Mm -hmm. Great, so let's talk about another actor now. There, there's another question that has just popped into the box, China. Where does China fit in this conversation on the Sahel? That its strategies, where does it fit here in the Sahel? Michelle, would you like to take that? I can take a stab, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, China, pitches itself as a sort of um, take you as you are partner, right? Uninterested in discussions around governance, interested in um, building uh, its support base in multilateral institutions and in kind of uh, economic arrangements uh, that uh, are appealing. Uh, to China and uh, can be appealing to 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 partners. So, what one thing I find interesting is is that kind of model of engagement um, thrives with consistency and stability, right? The China doesn't um, win when there's a tremendous amount of churn at the top. Uh, so. You know, what I have seen thus far is um, kind of a wariness um, uh, to wade too deeply into uh, this very tumultuous situation uh, in the Sahel where, you know, some of these junta leaders do not uh, seem to have a very limited shelf life, not because I think things are going to return to constitutional democracy, but they're going to be replaced by somebody else in fatigues. Um, and so you know, how, how often does that mean a, a deal gets reviewed, contracts are um, tossed out to start again? That's not terribly good uh, mm -hmm. for Chinese policy, uh, but they're certainly not in the, um, in the habit of criticizing uh, the political developments, as long as they're not critical of China, uh, in other countries. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And Jindai, still on that question on, on China, but I also have a question in here too as well that I'd like to tag on to that. Um, and so this question is, um, is there any evidence or historical support that shows that sanctions are actually effective in countries where there, there has been a coup? And then this question also has a second part where we look at Nigeria. Obviously, when we talk about West Africa, we can't ignore Nigeria in these conversations. So this question is how long will Nigeria keep its borders closed to Niger? And how effective is this? What do you think would be the outcome of this? Wow, now that's, that's those are some deep questions. Um... I don't think sanctions work alone. Sanctions only work with significant diplomacy, right? And, and in fact, sanctions can sometimes become counterproductive um, because often we put sanctions on that we don't know how to take off. There's no out. <laughs> and so even if a government starts making changes that are positive, it takes us a very long time to unravel all the sanctions that we put on 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 individuals um, and leaders and countries, um, and so I mean, sanctions have worked. Not necessarily. I can't think of a situation where they work to change the outcome of a coup, um, but they have. Like, I think that the sanctions that we put on Liberia, on Charles Taylor, um, on you, you know diamonds and on. Um, uh, rubber, the trees, um, you know, that those sanctions hurt. Those those sanctions were biting into 
his ability to carry out a war and to you know you know do his repression and then when we engage Gaddafi right it was a, 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 a separate situation which was Gaddafi got caught with AQ Khan you know weapons of proliferation mm -hmm. and the the conditions for us to re-engage with Gaddafi was stop uh, arming Charles Taylor and stop funding Charles Taylor. That was one of the conditions. There were a list of them, but we definitely put West Africa on that. I think that made a big difference um, in the trajectory of that civil war and ending it, um, and even the regional war. So it does have an impact. When I think about who's being um, overturned, it wasn't. It's not sanctions. It's it's actually um, either you know engagement with the leadership of the country and the will of the of that leader. Sanctions are there, but. I think about Nigeria in 1999. Um, what, what's his name? General um, Tanya Bacha. No, 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 no. The general that actually led to the Abu Salam Abubakar. Yes, Abubakar. Exactly. That was you know we we engaged him. Um, and I think about was it Mokhtar Torre in um, ATT uh, in um, in Mali, right? Where 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 they were engaged, or I think about Lesotho where basically the South Africans and Botswanans and others overturned that coup d'etat, you know? Um, and I think that's, that's happened in, that happened with the ECOWAS forces in Sierra Leone as well, where they overturned the coup d'etat because they had forces on the ground. I um, mean, obviously- the Gambia the when Jammin didn't want to leave, right? Yes, the, the ECOWAS came in with Senegal, you know, saying it's going to happen. So I think that active engagement, sanctions can help, over time, but I, I for one think that sanctions are too often used as an excuse for diplomatic engagement. Um, I'm not one to rush to, oh, I'm gonna sanction you, I'm gonna sanction you, um, because it's not helpful for our bilateral relationships over the long term. What we need to do is change the behavior, not just sanction people. The idea of sanctions are that they're gonna help change the behavior, but I don't see that often. Mm -hmm. That's my answer. <laughs> Thank you so much. And so the question on Nigeria and keeping its borders closed from Niger, how effective is this? Well, you know, I think that Ni Nigeria did had the right instinct 100%. And I know that this would be very controversial, uh, but I, for one, would have liked to see the United States rally behind ECOWAS. United States had forces on the ground. I know no one wants to have a war, right? Everybody's like, oh, my God, there's going to get another war. And I understand that. Um, but United States had forces on the ground. Um, quite frankly, the presidential guard in Niger struck without having all of the other elements of the military on their side. And so the United States had come in forcefully saying we're backing ECOWAS and making moves to, you know, lift and all that. And what and also with forces on the ground and talking to those leaders who hadn't yet joined the coup you might have been able to prevent it because to stop a coup, you need to do it like in the first few days, right? After that, it's over. Um, and I think we had the ability to do that. I'm going to tell you what happened. Uh, Jake Sullivan said, why do we have an interest? Why do we care? The very question you asked, why do we have an interest in Niger, right? And like, well, you just said that Niger was the motto of democracy in December at your Africa summit. And you said that, you know, there's going to be a community of democracies <laughs> and that we stand up for democracy. And this guy is actually a democratic leader trying to do the right things. We've significantly engaged him. Uh, and what's our interest? Um, so, you know, we just took, you know, my way, my my way is probably a lot more risky but also risk comes with reward. Their way is just status quo. Nothing happens. And we show ourselves not to really be there for democratic leaders, right? So why should countries think that the United States is going to stand with them for democracy when we, the very country that we highlighted as a democratic country and leader, we had no answer for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. And Michelle, I'm going to turn to you to add a little bit on, on that too as well. I see another question has come in, but I'm being reminded that we have only six minutes. 
So I might not be able to take another question. So this is still linked to the discussion on sanctions. And I, I guess this person is just stressing the point and asking why Nigeria is still continuing with sanctions um, to its Niger, closing its border to the people of Niger, because it is really hurting local communities and local populations over there. Yeah, I think it's um, politically very, very difficult um, uh, for President Tanubu uh, to be able to continue to maintain these, given the hardships this creates for for uh, communities in Nigeria that have depended on cross border transactions, and uh, you know. There's plenty of hardship to go around in Nigeria as it is, as they undertake some difficult uh, policy reforms. But I, I do think that it's a difficult thing to walk back in some ways. You know, the the notion that ECOWAS was going to draw a firm line that they weren't going to stand for this, you know, domino after domino falling to to military coups, which. Uh, you know, the leaders, the democratically elected leaders have a self-interest in stopping and and a principled interest, right? These are principles that uh, are enshrined in, in the AU charter. They're, they're part of um, ECOWAS's uh, documents. And, and so I think, you know, the notion that we've been too um, complacent about these developments and this is only spreading and getting worse, I, I think that analysis was correct and that the region needed to draw a firm line to try and delegitimize this type of activity. So then I think it becomes very difficult to say, oh, well, you know, now here we are. And, and so never mind. I, I, you know, I think the, the fear that is well founded is that this just incentivizes others to say, well, I might as well shoot my shot here because there will be some temporary discomfort. Uh, but if, at the end of the day, we'll all just get along. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you both so much um, for your uh, responses and your contributions. This has been a very, very informative discussion. I actually have some questions of my own too as well. So I may have to hit both of you up individually with some of the questions that I have. But this has been a very, very rich conversation. We have three minutes left. And in this three minutes, I just want to turn to both of you again, just in a quick minute or just a minute, any part, parting final words that you want to leave our audience with? Michelle, you've started first, so I'll let you. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess I would just say that it, I think it's easy in discussions of the Sahel to, uh, to get a sense of hopelessness, right? The problems are many and complex and vast. Um, but I do think, and I know there are people participating in this event who, who've spent time on the ground, right? A, a little exposure uh, goes a long way in, in terms of um, recognizing there are also extraordinary people doing amazing things in very difficult circumstances to try and improve the lives of their families, their communities, their countries, and a little more, you know, I want media attention to the problems, but a little more media attention too to some of these people so that we recognize there are real partners for getting things, making things better in the Sahel. There are real partners there uh, just just waiting to be tapped. Thank you very much, Michelle. Jendai? I agree with everything Michelle says, 100%. <laughs> Always. <laughs> So, so thank you so much to both of you. And I think just to echo your words, while the situation might sit, seem pretty grim on the ground, there are a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of talent in the local population. There are a lot of partners and a lot of relationships, especially with the people that we can build. And really, that's what America that's what we're known for in the region, our people-to-people -people relationships. And I think we have to tap into tap into our strengths. Uh, so thank you so much on behalf of, of all of us and the World Affairs Council. We thank everyone for joining this conversation. And we hope this discussion on the Sahel and West Africa doesn't end here, but it continues. Thank you so much and goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.